Hey there, internet friends. Welcome to another episode of That Nerdy Site Show, a weekly podcast where the team members from That Nerdy Site get together to talk about the, our lives and all of the things we love about them, all the nerdy things we love about them. It's been a while. No, it hasn't. It hasn't been a while since I've done this intro. I do this intro every week. I don't know why I'm struggling with it. I'm on a struggle bus today. Uh, I'm your host, Trevor Starkey. Joining me, uh, this is a new thing we haven't done in a while. We have a three-person show today. We have Cameron Abbott joining me. How you doing, Cameron? Hey, what's going on? Uh, my life and every day is a struggle bus, so I get you, Trevor. Fair, fair enough. And Logan Wilkinson back on the show. How you doing, Logan? I'm doing great. Excellent. Uh, yeah, fun little three-person show, so I had to go through and, like, come up with uh, images to fill our fourth little frame of our pair of sunglasses that we have uh, in uh, in these things. Um, uh, so yeah, we're going to be talking about a handful of things today, including Cyberpunk 2077, Thor Love and Thunder, uh, uh, Cult of the Lamb, Final Fantasy XIV's Island Sanctuary and the, and the latest patch, uh, Ghost of Tsushima Platinum Trophy Hunting, and mm -hmm. uh, the Amazon Prime series A League of Their Own. Uh, so a fun mixed bag of a show today, <laughs> a little bit of, a yeah. little bit of old, a little bit of new, a little bit of, uh, a little bit of everything. Uh, but before I hop into any of that, uh, I want to give a little bit of housekeeping, um, shout out to Friday Night Dying Light, our weekly, uh, Dying Light 2 Let's Play series that Cameron has been playing most of this year. Uh, we just had episode 30 go live. Uh, we're down to the final four now uh, that are left to to release. Uh, so go give uh, give some eyes on that uh, if you are interested in some Friday Night Lights themed Dying Light 2 content. Uh, we we're I'm pretty sure the only place on the Internet where you can find that combination of things um, i guarantee it yeah unless you're unless this happened post and people were like i could do that and then you do it and it's probably going to be more successful than mine and i hate you so there you go <laughs> fair enough uh and inspired by that um i've started doing a uh a just normally themed playthrough of skyrim uh uh where i've got a handful of uh, uh, uh two episodes up so far i think or no just one episode so far but i've got like another three weeks of them like already in the can and and scheduled scheduled out and stuff so um go check out uh our youtube for new let's plays every tuesday and thursday and cameron's friday night specials uh on friday evenings um uh yeah if you like what you hear please remember to like subscribe rate review share the podcast with your friends all that fun stuff actually i'll give one more shout out uh we shouted out last week as well um but it is definitely now up for sure uh you can go check out uh logan's uh written mm -hmm. rankings of all of the james bond movies uh mm -hmm. as kind of the culmination of our that bond show series that we also did earlier in the year uh, so Cameron, I will have you kick it off. You, you mentioned, we've talked about this game many a times over, uh, over the various shows on this channel. Uh, but yeah. you hopped back into Cyberpunk 2077 not too long ago. Uh, and, uh, recently you beat it and got a much better ending than you had previously. Uh, so what, what drove you to, to hop back into Cyberpunk? You know, I was just craving a world to run around in and do cool stuff in. Um, and, you know, that's one of Cyberpunk's 2077 strengths is that it does have a night city as it's as a city escape and like open world has a lot that is, um, especially with all the updates that they've done to it. It's really brought that city, a very vibrant city, even more to life. Mm -hmm. um, a big complaint when the game launches kind of how empty this big open city was. And since then, they've, you know, filled it in with all sorts of updates and NPCs and all sorts of like different things. Um, they've made like people were like, why are there no children? And they said, okay, fine, we'll make children. They took regular size models no, and then like those, shrunk their proportions. Those guys were in there in the beginning. Those were they? I don't. Remember. Yeah, yeah, they were. They were nightmare children, all all the way back at that launch. And it was like, this is these are just very clearly just shrunk down like adult models. This is weird. It's been changed up. There's a lot more like unique kid models now. Um, it, there's a lot going on in that game that is like still like back to the original point we made during our game of the year discussion it's a vibrant rich world that doesn't say much um like the, the biggest problem with the cyberpunk as a or the biggest point of cyberpunk as a genre is it's supposed to be calling out the rampant and uh like terrible consumerism and the way that uh you know corporate oligarchies have a firm hold on the throat of government and institutions and how that's a, a terrible and awful thing. And it's 
very apparent that it's a terrible and awful thing in the game series, but the game, the characters never, like, there's never a definitive statement by you that you are able to make as a main character that is not just face value, um, shallow kind of just dialogue. Hmm. And so, like, that's it. That's still prevalent in the game. That's still a major issue with the game. Um, but uh, back to the point was I just needed to be doing something and I kind of fell back into kind of getting through the game and I was like, I was in the middle of a, a playthrough where it was my second playthrough trying to get this secret ending um, because the first time around I, I screwed it up. And so I took the, what do people call the worst ending, um, which is fine. Uh, but I was able to finally get to the point today, actually today, earlier today, I, uh, I plowed through the story. I, I, I made my way through the final mission um, it is notoriously difficult. Um, it's certainly, it's certainly the hardest mission in the game, I feel. Um, but at the same time, I was, I was level 50. I was like, I don't believe it's a cap, but like, it's, it's quite high. Like I, I did every single side mission you can do in that game. Not intentionally, just because I was like, I want to boost my level. Fastest way to do that is to do quests. And that's what I was doing. Um, and I was just running around the city, like doing a bunch of stuff. So I had like over like 5 million Euro, like Euro dollars. I was like, I was like, I had basically outed this game or not, not outed. Um, uh, like I torn this game apart. That's what I'm trying to say. I tore the game apart and like made my way through it and finally beat it. And I have to say my, my opinion from game of the year hasn't changed really that much, except I like that. I got the better ending that I, the ending that I initially wanted. Um, I still to like right now, I can honestly say, I don't think that should be a secret ending. I think that should just be an option in the game. Um, it's kind of like the real, the reality is, is that the story of that game is not as strong as it could be. Um, especially when you have a lot of like really cool, vibrant characters in that game. Um, there's never an opportunity to really like stand out other than this, like really generic, um, sort of cyberpunk adventure that is, it's parts are far more interesting than the sum. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, yeah. it's fascinating that you like also hop back into it. Cause I, I also, when I was looking for, you know, a world to, to jump back into earlier this year, and especially when the 1.5 patch came out finally, mm -hmm. and they, and they actually made like the next gen versions. Um, I hopped back into it for a little while and was, was playing through, I think it probably made it into like act two as a nomad this time. Um, uh, and was like enjoying the different flavors of the of the game that that had given versus my uh, corpo run originally when uh, when the game first came out, uh, and then you know other things started coming out and I just kind of fell off of it and and it's it's interesting that like when I was clamoring again more recently for a world to jump back into i didn't go back to that game even though like i can still see the like the disc and stuff on my uh on my little uh my entertainment center so it's like there as a constant reminder that hey like you, you were playing this game not too long ago um but instead i jumped into skyrim <laughs> so uh you know uh different and I'll uh, be, different sensibilities yeah. of their world building i think yeah i also think that despite the despite the datedness of skyrim i still think that it's probably like as far as especially with the um especially in with consideration towards the kind of story the openness of the story they were telling the variety in which the world changes around you is far more impactful and far more successful in skyrim than it is in cyberpunk mm, yeah um part of the issue like and that the thing about it is like skyrim Bethesda was doing this and it's interesting because the way Bethesda like shrunk down things with Fallout 4 in comparison to Skyrim um was is an interesting theory I just thought of, like not theory but like kind of like conundrum that I had thought of and it is kind of like the simplicity of Skyrim's kind of like build and the way that it's built out has allowed it to kind of like be a more expansive game than the kind of effort and work that it takes to make a modern modern gen game um, I don't know. That's a that's a, that's just some food for thought. But I still like contend Skyrim is one of the greatest worlds ever, like gaming worlds ever created. Yeah, it's definitely um, been fun hopping back into it. Um, and and like the the things that come back to me, like the places and the locations, and like oh, that's right. If I go around this corner, I'm gonna you know trip a trap or something like that. So I gotta you know be mindful of those kinds of things. Like as 
there's like a procedurally generated aspect to that game of like oh yeah you can get like bounties and it's just gonna send you off to a random dungeon you'll go kill a guy and then you come back but still like even that is cool because it it like it incentivizes you to explore all of the myriad of dungeons that they put into that game that you might not have otherwise like tried to experience or explore or something like that um so yeah they did a really cool they just had some cool cool ideas and mechanics in that but um, well, I'm glad you got your your good ending in in Cyberpunk, um, uh, and I'm glad that like yeah, the world is a lot more fleshed out now for you to to hop back into. Uh, which what were you playing this run? I've only ever played Nomad. Nomad. I I, I like there is a part of me that wants to kind of do Corpo or Street Kid, but um, at the same time, like I'm pretty much good with the game right now. Yeah. Um, Nomad Nomad, in my opinion, is the best choice. Like it just there's something about well so. I'm going to tell, break down my cyberpunk character that I made. Um, I made a mustached, slicked hair back, cowboy hat wearing, uh, you know, I basically did this nomad cowboy uh, in, this, in the big city with, and the only guns I used were, were like revolvers. So I only used, so I, I basically was the, the cowboy with the big iron on his hip running around Night City. Um, and that's, that's just a fun way that I like to play that game. Um, I ended up getting into a tight spot and picking up an enemy, um, like assault rifle in the final mission. And I had to, I have to say, I think I have been missing out on a lot of the variety in that game. (laughs) Yeah. Um, only using revolvers as kind of like my old revolvers and like katana blades. That's it. Yeah, there you go. I, yeah, I don't um, think I, I, I don't think I use revolvers like once. I was more I, like I was more of a an, an SMG or assault rifle or a shotgun person. But yeah, also just using katanas or I didn't I didn't find it in my original run through. But there's like a, a side quest that you can do where like you get basically a non lethal giant dildo as a weapon. Um, I have had that, and that is how I usually take down cyber psychos in that game. There you go. Yeah. I beat them till they're unconscious with a. Uh, with a dildo yeah that is that is part of the game i have to say it is part of the game's charm (laughs) best best saints row game that came out two years ago is uh, actually cyberpunk 2077 (laughs) accurate yes um like with that that just had all sorts of like remembering it the problem that i have with that is that it is a very fleshy colored dildo yeah it's um it it, it was a lot seeing it uh, like also I made the mistake of not turning off um, the nudity mm. uh, because so whenever I want to change clothes or I was like out of my my pants, my my dingling was just like hanging out there and it made me upset because the the dildo weapon is a much better looking penis than the actual penis attached to your character. Well, it's upsetting. There you it's go. upsetting on a, several levels. Also, the people care in that game. I don't care if we're on next gen at this point. It still doesn't look right. It looks weird. People care looks weird in that game. I don't know. One day, Cameron. One day. Realistic <laughs> pubic hair physics. We ask Make for. it happen, games industry. There you go. That's. I'm sure Devolver Digital is probably working on at least two games with that as like their central mantra. Uh, Shower with your dad. Simulator two. <laughs> what was it like there wasn't there like a dong fighter game or something like that oh there was a dong fighter game yeah, yeah. So, some something with dongs i remember um well anyway uh uh i'm glad you got your happy ending or you're you're not yeah, you're I, not I, crappy I ending not, in cyberpunk it, i wouldn't i there's no such thing as like a quote-unquote happy ending in cyberpunk yeah because it and here's the thing it's in theme with cyberpunk literature so I, like the the idea is there's no such thing as a happy ending because this world there are no happy endings. yeah because the world sucks. That's the point of cyber. All right. Uh, well, let's throw it over to you, Logan, because uh, you finally got to sit down with Thor: Love and Thunder. Um, mm-hmm. And I want to, I want to, just I guess preface this at the top. Do you want this to be a spoiler conversation? Because because sure. Cameron and I have already done like a full spoiler cast yeah. on it on this podcast. So yeah, I'll fine. put I'll put in the like in the in the time code that this will be like a spoiler conversation. So yeah. if you're not spoilers. interested or or you want to kind of avoid spoilers or whatever, mm-hmm. uh, click to the next time code where we'll jump into Cult of the Lamb, um, and uh, and and feel free to skip ahead. 
Uh, we'll also, I'm sure, be doing Thor: Love and Thunder as a that D plus show in uh, oh, right. in a couple weeks' time once it comes out yeah. on Disney Plus Day as well. So you're gonna get all the Thor: Love and Thunder conversations. If we're not out here to talk about a B tier Marvel movie, then I don't know what else we're gonna do. All mm-hmm. right, fair enough. All right, so there, there's a preliminary uh, impression of your thoughts on Thor: Love and Thunder. So what did, uh, yeah, what'd you think? I think it's, I think it's fun. I think it's okay, right? Like it. Thor is such a weird character where I don't know anyone whose favorite Avenger is Thor. Um, I, I know, know several people. I know a lot of people who I feel like who like Thor and it's like, yeah, like he's fun. But like I, he's not that I feel like name that people go to a lot, especially obviously with how the MCU is crafted kind of around the twin pillars of Captain America and Iron Man. But I think. Thor has been really interesting to watch unfold and now be like the last Avenger like left in a lot of ways still doing his own films um, and the fact that he's had the most movies of anyone now and to see that arc and how much that character has shifted from where he was at in Thor 1 to here is just like miles and miles and miles apart and I think this is probably the second best Thor movie Right, which is sort of a meaningless thing because the gulf in between these four movies, I feel like, are so big. Right, like I th- like like most people, I think Dark World is not good. Um, and then like most people, I think that the original Thor is like fine and like really pretty to look at at times, but mostly like this is fine. Um, there are moments here I enjoy. Um, and so like, I think this is a good movie that isn't as good as Ragnarok. Um, I think the humor of it still works me more than it doesn't, but it feels less refined, I think, than it was in Thor Ragnarok and a bit more, we're just going to throw a hundred jokes at you and just kind of see what sticks to the wall. Um, and if you don't like that particular joke, it's okay. There's another one already locked and loaded in the chamber, ready to go. So you don't have to like sit on it too long. Um, it did leave me with the impression, though, that a little bit like with Tony Stark and Iron Man, I'm at the point now where like I've gotten my character arc with Thor. Like I'm resolved with that character. And it feels like they sort of like reset where he was at a little bit in i guess it would have been end game for this movie to kind of have him go in like another character arc that i had already kind of gotten the resolution for um but like i like his journey well enough here um and i think the ending is really great we're doing spoilers i guess like, i i love like the idea of like him having this kind of like surrogate daughter figure now with him um and i think it's a really great idea i think natalie portman is really great i also think that I was surprised they introduced her and then killed her off. Um, but am both happy they did because like I like when Marvel just lets people die. And I'm also like, well, that could have been more fun to have in another movie. Um, I mean, did you stick around for the uh, end, the end credits? Right, yeah, but like, yeah. I don't, I don't think we're going to see Natalie Portman again anytime soon. Um, or ever again. Um, but I wouldn't be so sure. Yeah, I mean, like, to- it's totally possible. Like, I also think that, like, the reason we didn't see Natalie Portman in another movie after the second one is also just because, like, Natalie Portman had a bit of a pop for a few years, right? And was out there winning Oscars and stuff. And so, like, I also don't know how much incentive or desire she has to be in these kind of movies. But, like, yeah, it's a fun movie. It's interesting. Um, it's tonally weird, I think, at times. And I-, I think, again, it's just, like, for me, the takeaway is it is a lot less it feels to me like a lot less refined and put together as like immaculately as Ragnarok was which we all saw together um all those years ago and that movie I think it just flows so well and like every piece functions so well and they nail the tone and the humor and just kind of the characters so well and this one I think is a bit more wobbly but it also has to like deal with the ramifications that are really big from the last few movies uh that Thor has been involved in and so like that by its necessity maybe take some of the like momentum and excitement and fun out of what Ragnarok was doing. Yeah, it's 
it's interesting, like, because again, Cam and I have uh, obviously talked at length about this already, but um, one of the things you touched on of like the, you know, the the gulf between where Thor started this journey and where Thor is now is like, is mm-hmm. such a huge chasm. And I think one of my biggest frustrations with the movie is that it ha- it it sets up a perfect opportunity to, to highlight that change of the character. It it sets up the perfect opportunity for Thor to be like, I used to be the kind of god that you hate, Gore, but I've changed. I'm trying to be better. I'm trying to be. I'm trying to help. Um, and it just doesn't. It doesn't like mm-hmm. have that self awareness of the Thor's power of growth. love, Trevor. Right. Yeah. Um. So it's it it like I think that's a a big shortcoming of the film is that like it comes so close to to like really thematically touching on Thor's journey and then just doesn't like, it doesn't pull the trigger on like saying, yeah, we know what we're doing with this. It's, it's, it's almost an accidental thematic, like, uh, like the Thor in the original Thor movie would have loved going and, and being an omnipotent city and, and meeting his hero. And, and this Thor is like, does meet his hero and, you know, realizes or has that like never meet your heroes kind of moment with with Zeus um and that's like the closest we get to Thor recognizing his growth I think or or commenting yeah. on his growth over all these years um I guess he has a little bit of, in one of his scenes with uh with the, the mighty Thor uh where he talks about you know like when I first met you I was blah 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 but you changed me you made me better that that kind of thing but yeah it's just not like I think it it could have gone some some interesting more interesting places than it does because yeah I think it it's I think its priority was throwing all those jokes at the wall and 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 seeing what sticks and it wasn't right it's trying to it's trying to recapture the magic of Thor Ragnarok but Thor Ragnarok was just such a new and unique beast in right. in, in the MCU that like a lot like the the surprise factor is gone this time around right and also I think we you know I I, I think there is a little bit of you know the fact that uh you know we don't get loki um we don't get mm-hmm. uh we don't have uh thor kind of bouncing off the hulk for this one mm-hmm. um i think some of the the like magic chemistry that hit in thor ragnarok yes. is just also yeah. gone yeah it's interesting you touching on that brought something to mind that i like hadn't been able to i think put words to which is thor is kind of just like yeah like he i guess conceited maybe arrogant is what i would go with at the beginning of this movie with his like a whole like speech and like destroying their like shrine to the gods and all that kind of stuff and like he doesn't really change from that too much by the end of the movie like he's got a kid in tow and i think he's like self-aware to some level but he's still very much like playing it up and is very hammy even at the end with like the surrogate daughter love and everything and it's an interesting character arc even within the movie, right? Because he has these moments of, like, self-reflection with, you know, Jane and, you know, Love and Gore and all these characters around him that, like, tease out something that they don't really ever build on. And so, like, when you get to the end of the movie, it's like, oh, yeah, like, he is just sort of the same character. And, like, he is kind of an asshole at the beginning. And, like, there's a reason why, like, the Guardians are, like, weren't that sad to see him go. And, like... He's only slightly different than that. And, like, it is interesting in that regard versus, like, I think some of the other characters in the MCU who I think they've had better ideas. And, like, I think my issue with Thor throughout the entirety of the MCU now for, what, 13, 14 years, whatever it's been, is that, like, he feels like the Avenger in some ways that they've never really had a clear plan for, right? Like, it just sort of seems like they keep, like, starting and stopping this character's growth and arc to kind of fit whatever the new director wants to do with it or whatever the new story beat needs for them to do, and, like, they can't commit to it, which can lead to, like, really great things happening, like with Ragnarok, where, like, it allowed a really cool, fresh take on that character. But it can also then be viewed when you get to his fourth movie, plus all the other Avenger movies he's been in, and it's like, you know, after like eight or nine movies of Thor, I'm still largely like, he's only so much different than he was. And I still only like him 
as the character maybe so much, right? Like, like you said, I think so much of the magic of Ragnarok is the incredible chemistry that the three of those characters in Loki, Hulk, and Thor all have together. Um, and then when you remove them here, I think Chris Hemsworth is a talented actor. I think Natalie Portman's a talented actor. I don't know if I've ever been particularly in love with the two of them together and their relationship and chemistry. I think it's always been like, this is good, but hardly spectacular. And I think I hold the same opinion here. And so I think you feel the absence of Loki and I think you feel the absence of the Hulk in this movie. Um, yeah, and it's just, yeah, it's it's totally off at times, I think. Yeah, they like... Because, uh, I mean, there were a couple other, you know, key pillars in Korg and, and Valkyrie in, right. in Thor, uh, Thor Ragnarok. And and they, like, especially Korg, I think they just double down so much on Korg yes. in this one that it's like, this is a lot of Korg. <laughs> like, yes. this is a lot of Korg when a little bit of Korg goes a long way. Um, yeah. I mean, he's literally the, the intro and the outro of the movie is him. Mm -hmm. And I don't, yeah, it's... They definitely doubled down on that character. Yeah. It's the it's the the Joey Tribbiani effect or the Barney Stinson right. effect of Barney like Stinson effect. The, yeah, absolutely. These characters that are like great in like the role that they were originally created for and designed for, but then they become too big for their britches a little bit and kind of take up a little bit too much of the room. Yeah. Um, Cam, any uh, any thoughts to add from from your perspective since we've uh, since we've discussed this? Sure. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts, um, but I think I can kind of condense them down into. Um, for me, the biggest takeaway from Thor Love and Thunder is that I do really enjoy Thor movies. Um, Thor The Dark World is not my least favorite Marvel film. Uh, that that belongs to uh, Edward Norton's Incredible Hulk. Which is um, also fair. <laughs> it's, yeah. I mean, it's, it's um, usually those two in the conversation right, yeah, for the bottom of the list. If we're allowed to include it, Ang Lee's Hulk I mean, is no, by far the worst. We're, we're not. That's not in the MCU. Yeah. I know it's not an MCU, that Trevor, but that's the point. If we were allowed that to, that would be the worst one, but it's not. Um, we're in the MCU, and so Edward Norton's The Incredible Hulk is unfortunately the worst one. Um, so yeah, I I like I'm I'm in the camp of I really have always liked the chemistry that Chris Hemsworth and Natalie Portman bring to these characters. Hmm. Um, I feel like there's a very like natural chemistry to them in a way that um, I think the problem is is that. Thor has gone on a very long ass journey from Thor the Dark World. Um, you have Thor the Dark World. From Thor the Dark World, you have uh, Avengers Age of Ultron. You have, um, or is Age of Ultron before or after? Uh, it was uh, It was after. Because it, it was Thor, then Avengers, then Thor the Dark World, Avengers Age of Ultron. Yeah, so you have Age of Ultron development. You have uh, Ragnarok development. You have... Uh, Infinity War, Endgame. Infinity War, Endgame. Um, you have, and then we get to this point where he has literally gone on several arcs and journeys, and so he's kind of a settled character into where things are at. Where he's a performer when he has people in front of him, like at the beginning of the movie, he performs very well. But when it comes to these more human moments, he's a lot less boisterous. He's a lot less arrogant. He's a lot less. Um, the sh like the show of Thor is out and about for the general populace and he f and he like hams it up and he buys him into it himself. But when he's alone with Jane, I felt that there was a especially when he finds out that she's sick and dying. He puts like he really like I love the moments in at the end of the film when he tells Jane, you need to stop because. We like we deserve a future together. We like we deserve a chance to have this future and you deserve to live. And when Jane makes the decision to be the mighty Thor at the end of the film, there is an acknowledgement that he has about her about her willingness and her sacrifice. And I, I love the aspect of it where even I think Endgame or not Endgame, I think um, Infinity War Thor, especially with how like emotionally wounded he was after the death of his people in Loki, he still would have taken the fight to Gore at the infinity point, right? At the, or eternity, wherever that, that area was. But his growth and his journey and his loss make it, may have, have made him realize taking the fight to Gore at that moment isn't the right move. The move is to stay with Jane because the way he says, if I only have a few moments left in the world, 
I'm going to spend it with the person I love. And he does that. And that marks a change in gore. And in a way, it provides the victory. Like, the the gods are not all slain. Um, you have that as kind of like the, this pirate victory of, of all of that. And I love the moments where you have with I, I love the moments of vulnerability with both Jane and Thor's characters. And I think those are done very well. But I think the problem with that movie is that it doesn't transition well. I think I, I mentioned that during our spoiler cast, there's some really rough transitions. There's not, it does not ease itself into any of its scene changes. Mm -hmm. um, it makes, it is a very, Roughly, am I? And I'm I mean, gonna make I, half of the scene changes uh, involve goats screaming. So yeah, it's it's yeah. making a point about these are not smooth transitions, or or we're going to go very tonally, wildly different places. And I think one of the things that Ragnarok did so well is that it only went to a handful of places, but each one of those places was like really well done and really transitioned in well. You have when it's. Mid, uh, you have like the really kind of like quicker transitions in the beginning of the film in Ragnarok, where he's on the Hell Planet and then he goes to Asgard. But when he goes to Asgard, he's there for a minute. We get to see the play happen. We get all that, and then it's a, that transition to Midgar, and it's not just a well, this is where you put him, right? And then it's like oh, we'll oh, we'll find him this way. It's a process in which they go through these scenes, have a moment with Doctor Strange, that leads them to where their dad is. They are they have a moment to breathe and kind of like take in the scenery where they're at in those throughout Ragnarok, all of it. And like, because that it feels lived in and it feels great. And I think that that is missing on several aspects. Also the, I felt like the, I know in our spoiler cast, I said, I felt like the um, Jane Foster stuff at the beginning of the movie felt really weirdly like, like structured in how it kind of like all played out. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's that and that so put that aside but honestly I like the movie but I think you're I know do not think you're wrong Logan I think it's a B tier Marvel movie. Yeah. and there's nothing wrong with that being a B tier Marvel movie it just it's certainly not of the height and also let's face it well we are never going to get a movie like Thor Ragnarok ever again I will never laugh and have as much fun in a movie as I had seeing Thor Ragnarok with you guys and everybody else at Extra Life that year. Um, that was an amazing movie experience, and that's still my favorite Marvel film. And I just don't like it. Doesn't capture the Ragnarok magic the way that I think it was trying to, mm -hmm. and it pays for that in a lot of sense. Yeah, so, I yeah. think the. I mean, I agree with a lot of. That. I mean, the the stuff I would say is. Yeah, I think I think Jane's introduction, like you said, is kind of wonky. I mean, I think they're sort of hurt a little bit by like real world things to have like. Obviously, I think a lot of the, like, the moments you described of, like, Thor and Jane talking to each other at the end when she's in, like, the hospital bed would have worked a lot better for me and would have been a lot stronger if there hadn't been, like, a nine-year absence from when we last saw her in, like, the MCU timeline or if she just was in other movies, even if it was just, like, a small appearance in one of the Avenger films or obviously in Ragnarok or something like that. Um, because I think that long gap hurt, whereas I think... You know, also Tony seeing, and also Pepper seeing Potts their, got to yeah. see kind of you get to see Pepper just kind of pop up sporadically throughout things. Obviously, yeah. Cap is always going on about Peggy, and so you just kind of have her like front of mind with that character. And I think Thor after Dark World just doesn't he like will throw away a line every now and again, but it's not quite the same love of like always talking about and referencing that character. And so that hurts it, but that's something that you just can't help when you're trying to make this movie all these years later. Um, but like, also, I think they, I think they wasted time on the domestic life stuff with them. I, agree. I felt like that did not play well um, very often. I felt like it, it honestly just could have been a narrative of it, of it being like Valkyrie talking to Jane and being like, so like, like yeah, you guys seem to like get along really great, and you guys have like a really good like things are really good between you two. What happened? And Jane just being like, well, you know, when you're when he's pulled away for every crisis right. going on, and when I'm traveling and doing lectures and all being this stuff. It's like our, our, yeah, yeah. Being, a, being an incredible scientist who's literally like breaking ground in physics. Like we were both so caught up with what we were trying to do to try to like in our own way, like help the world um, that we like, we lost track of our relationship and it just kind of ended. Which takes me to like the thing that I maybe liked the least on the film, which is like, 
I think almost none of the narration worked for me. Oh yeah, no um, narration in this movie. Especially in the movie was pretty bad. Expe- again, like the two bookends are one thing, like that. Oh, uh, hold on, hold like, on a second, because we got a canonical, like sexy mustached rock man at the That's end, true. and That's I support true. that one thousand percent. Like the two that begin in the movie are one thing, but like when it kept popping up throughout the film, in particular when it described like what happened with Thor and Jane and that whole narrated scene. I was like, none of this works for me. It's, all of it is just more distracting than anything else. And like, I just constantly pulled me out. And um, it ties back into like doubling and tripling down on that character and this idea. And it's just like, this doesn't work. But I mean, ultimately, like, you know, I think there's more good than bad here. I just think it's a bit messy how it went about it, right? Like, I was just checking on my end, right? Like, I have Thor like on, on, like ranked what fifteenth on my letterbox of MCU movies, right? So it's below, you know, Spider Man Homecoming and Iron Man, and above Doctor Strange and Civil War. Like I think it's just in like that mid range tier of MCU movies. For me, Cameron loves my MCU ranking, by the way. Um, well, but like, we that's we had we had a friend beg us to just stop arguing when we were arguing about Civil War. So that was in a car and he couldn't get out of the car that's true that. that's true um, i mean it, i always it, i just think it, of even when we, when we drove to disneyland all together with me you obviously trevor and frank and like having like the whole like mc competition among the four of us there um yeah like there there are interesting things i think savor's got a lot of issues but like i think it's like a mid-tier marvel movie so like it's not bad by any means i don't think it's like excellent and i think it is a good movie um that yeah it has definitely fun moments to it shout out to the matt damon cameo coming back yet again it's yeah still great. one one thousand percent that, that, that continuing and then when they're like let's make a play about the children being also sam neill being in it too yeah yeah, yeah. sam neill sam yeah neill i mean sam, sam neill was in was in ragnarok too so yeah. that was that was like the only new element of that troop was uh was the jenna mccarthy uh, uh yeah or, uh uh megan uh, megan mccarthy molly no Wait not, no, it's, who, it's definitely not Jenna McCarthy. It's not uh, Jenna McCarthy. Who is it? It's 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 yeah, uh, Melissa McCarthy. Melissa McCarthy. Melissa McCarthy. Thank you. Good, there it is. Good. Catch. Melissa, yeah, Melissa uh, McCarthy as Hella was great. incredible. Um. Uh. One last thing I wanted to uh, chime in on, kind of echo something you mentioned earlier, uh, Logan, of you know the the Thor issue of kind of changing to meet the whims of whichever director he's working with i think a lot of the mcu has that problem um in particular we talked about that a lot with um with wanda um go, oh going from like wandavision <laughs> to i wasn't here for the wandavision to, party. To, we, uh, i can talk Doctor about Str- yeah, or, yeah Doctor we'll do some madness for another hour here as well oh my yeah God, what that movie did um but in particular like thor we at least already had like one go around with his transition to taika waititi Versus mm-hmm. Natalie Portman here, who does feel like very different from yes. the last time, and and so when you like when you go back, it's like oh yeah, Natalie Portman worked with Kenneth Branagh, then Alan Taylor, and now Taika Waititi. Those are wildly different flavors, um, and yes. I think it's it's a testament to the performers that like you know they're still enjoyable as they are, and they they even if like. Yeah, I don't completely buy, you know, a smooth transition across those arcs. I still enjoy seeing these characters and and the mm-hmm. the uh, the performances um, from Natalie Portman, from Chris Hemsworth, from e- even from um, uh, 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 Elizabeth Olsen in uh, as Wanda. Like even when the the MCUification of things kind of like hurts their characters, right, yeah. they still tr- make the best of it and make it enjoyable as as much as they can. Um, so I do want to like shout that out, especially because, yeah, it was a giant gap here between, uh, Natalie Portman's last appearance and, and now. So like she did have, like, I think a lot of the, uh, I, I think that, um, that like montage of their like life together is trying to do the legwork since they haven't had that for the last like nine years. And it's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's executed pretty much about how you would expect, Taika Waititi's approach to that to me because it's it's <laughs> right. it's not like a I don't think it's like a serious let's really show you a like a glimpse you know in their into their life to give you a sense of what their relationship was it's let's do that with as many jokes as we can cram into that but really it's mm-hmm. just to get to the next thing it's it's to give that little exposition beat of 
Mjolnir was protecting her, and that's why she can be why she can pick up the hammer now. Okay, right. and that's and that's really the the, the big key beat. beat from that. Right. Um, so yeah, um, uh, shout out to to yeah, because like I still like despite me being like okay, this Jane Foster. Like the, the the old Jane Foster was never about making quips and trying to come up with catchphrases or anything like that. So, but like this one is su- suddenly super obsessed with it, um, uh, thing, yeah. and it's weird. Um, but it's still Natalie Portman, and she's still charming right. and wonderful. So, right. um, you know, I I get over it. Um, well, I'm glad you I'm glad you you know still ultimately enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Yeah, um, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, shout out to that. Um. So we will segue over. Uh, I talked about this a little bit last week. I'd only played a very little bit of it, um, but uh, Cult of the Lamb, uh, I then basically, like, after we recorded last week's episode, I basically spent the, like, all of Monday playing it and finishing the game. Um, and, yeah, I had a really good time with it. It's it's a pretty simple and straightforward short roguelike. There's basically, like, four kind of dungeons that you're kind of working through. Um, uh, and... Uh, uh, while you're doing that, you're building up your, your village, you're getting your, your cultists to, uh, you know, I, I mentioned to you last time, Cameron, uh, obviously that Frank had me pull a prank on you. I will say after we were, uh, after we finished recording, he told me to try pulling that prank again. He was like, that was so great. Make him eat another bowl of poop. And I didn't do it this time. So thank you. So Trevor. there you go. I did not thank make you. you eat another bowl of poop. Uh, and I think when all was said and done, I think I actually made Frank eat a bowl of like follower meat. Uh, w- like basically like when, when you sacrifice a follower or something like that, you'll get like the human meat kind of thing. Um, and it's an instant, like if, if one of your followers eats that, it will kill them too. <laughs> so I think Frank ended up dying by, uh, by, uh, being a cannibal effectively um but you can also like bring characters back to life and stuff like that um uh after i beat the game i went back in and uh and played a little bit more uh and jazz finally died (laughs) um uh because she died like naturally of old age at like the year at the age of a hundred um she i gave her like some kind of item that basically doubled her her normal life so long after like everybody else was gone (laughs) she was still around and and kicking um uh but yeah uh uh, again like a very fun little weird extremely devolver digital kind of mashup um of all of these different genres um the biggest issue i had with the game uh ended up being that late in the game i was encountering some not not game breaking in the way that like I've lost all my progress or whatever, but like uh, there was a, a known bug that I believe has been patched out now and, and I haven't encountered it since. Um, but basically like you can do the, you can do rituals um, where you basically get your followers around and you can basically perform a ritual to, um, to sacrifice somebody or to c- perform a wedding or to, uh, and, and like each of the rituals has like different benefits. You can do one that's basically like a feast and it boosts everybody's like hunger meters and stuff like that. Um, and there was a bug going on where uh, trying to do a ritual basically caused a soft lock in the game where you could still move around, but you couldn't like leave your temple and therefore you couldn't do anything else in the game. And the only way to get out of it was to basically close out and restart and so you'd lose whatever had happened up like prior to that event so you couldn't like save and stuff like that so that was a problem um but it it, like i was able to work around it for the last few hours of the game and still beat the game even though i couldn't perform any rituals um so yeah not like not the end of the world but i'm glad it has since been patched and they're they're continuing to uh to work on and and try and like improve the performance of the game um yeah, it's it is a very dark and bizarre sense of humor. This I like I I hope Frank gets a chance to play this game if he hasn't already because I think this is a very Frank game. I think Frank has a has a, you know, long running affinity for like Devolver games and Annapurna games and stuff like that and I think he will have a lot of fun with this one. Um uh and yeah, this was like it's it's very Hades like and it's very Animal Crossing like and it's very stardew valley like and like the like just dark twisted 
baby's first version of all of those games, I think a little bit, um, but still made for a very fun time. Uh, and you know, you're, you're running on a day and night cycle and uh, during the evenings, little spiders will come out and they will like steal shit from your uh, from your grounds and stuff. And it's like like they would steal coins and I'd have to go and squash the spider. And in addition to getting my coin back, I also get a little bit of a, a little meat that I can throw into a stew for uh, for my villagers and stuff like that. So, you know, shout out to, to being able to, to <laughs> kill a bunch of spiders and play uh, uh, um, uh, an exterminator like that. Um, yeah, like I maxed out like I've I've um over the course of the game um i think even before i beat it i basically had like learned and upgraded everything that you can do there's like a few upgrade trees there's like personal stuff that you can upgrade um uh there are which is which is going to be like when you go into a dungeon the kinds of weapons you get are going to be better and the kinds of items and stuff you can get are going to be better uh there's also like perks that you can buy and find in the dungeons and stuff like that um uh and then there's like a whole bunch of cosmetic stuff of like you can change the f- the the look of your followers you know if you don't want them if oh this this follower spat out and it's going to be a you know a giraffe person and you want to instead make it a unicorn person you can go and do that if you find the right like follower unlocks and stuff like that uh and then there's all of the like the different uh village amenities that you can build up um uh you're gonna be like there's like a little lumber mill that you can kind of set up and an ore mine for kind of the two main resources of wood and and uh and ore um there's a handful of crops that you can kind of grow uh you have to maintain um like outhouses effectively uh, because otherwise your animals will poop. And if other animals see the poop, they will get sick and it will increase their sick ratings and they might poop in turn or throw up and just becomes like this cycle that can go out of control really quick. Um, When people die, you have to bury your dead or people will again also get sick. Um, And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very, weird game but there's a lot of charm to it and i had a very fun time with it um so uh it's i mean it's it it definitely shot pretty high up in my game of the year thinking so far so um really enjoyed it i i'm a little annoyed by like the platinum for it because i'm like i want to get the platinum for it but that includes it's a bullshit platinum it's 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 not the most bullshit platinum but it is like um there are four main bosses that you fight kind of one in each of the main areas and basically like once you beat them you can go back and replay the area and you can like replay it and just kind of go through and like collect resources and stuff or you can like at a certain point you can kind of like take down the statue that was like in honor of that and that'll basically like take you to the boss fight and you can kind of replay the boss fight and there's a trophy uh for each of the bosses of kill this boss without getting hit um, and I managed to do it with the first boss, but I am not enough of a Soulsborne person to memorize <laughs> patterns and do all that shit for the rest right. of them. So it's it is unlikely I will ever <laughs> bother getting a, a the platinum in this one. Um, but other than that, it was a lot of fun, um, and uh, yeah, just a really good time with Cult of the Lamb. Um, so shout out to that game. Uh, had fun. Uh, you know, again, making making all you guys as characters and seeing how uh, how you you kind of like turned on each other, betrayed each other. And I started throwing in like friends from the community and stuff like that. At one point, Joey Noel had me lock up Kyle Stevenson uh, from Six One Indie because she was like, he's an outsider. He's you know, he's he's preaching against you he's not can't trust him he's not real can't trust him you got to lock him up and so yeah you can basically another one of the like the the facilities you can add to your little encampment is basically a stockade and you you throw somebody there in the stocks and you can like go and like re-educate them once a day to uh like decrease their like uh uh negativity towards you kind of thing um and so yeah just the the weird little mechanics in this game are just funny um and uh and and make for a good time uh so shout outs to cult of the lamb and the fun little weird stories it will give you especially if you go ahead and and name all of your cultists after friends uh any questions for me or anything before we move on no 
That sounds yeah. awesome. I want to play. But it, I always so. love the dynamic of naming characters after friends, whether it's Cold of the Lamb or like XCOM or obviously the kind of granddaddy of this, which is like Oregon Trail and naming everyone in scene who yeah. or who doesn't die of dysentery. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, I, I think you may have been away from uh, when I when I mentioned this, but like there are another ritual that you can cast is like the resurrection ritual. So like you can sacrifice somebody and then you can bring them back and you can sacrifice them again. <laughs> and uh, definitely did that to somebody. I don't remember who at this point, but um, yeah, there's 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 lots of just fun decisions you can make uh, in this game. Uh, so shout out to. Oh, yeah, there's there's also like uh, one thing I didn't touch on is like there's a there's a slight overworld in that. Like most of the game is going to take place on your your you know cult compound and then the like attached dungeons that you can jump into, but you can also jump out to like uh, a lighthouse area where you can where you can do a fishing mini game kind of thing and and catch some fish. Um, there's like a place that you can go to where you can play like a dice game. Uh, it's just kind of like you know this game's Gwent or whatever you know the 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 kind of side game where you can kind of go in Get play that. this dice game gamble um against other characters that you find throughout the the adventure um there's like this mushroom place where uh you go and you give this guy mushrooms that you find in the world and he will teach you a brainwashing ritual that will basically like you can cast it or you can use it and all of your people will be brainwashed for like a day or two and then there will be like a per, a, a some percent chance that when like the brainwash you know subsides they'll be sick um basically because you gave you gave them mushrooms for 2 days um uh and then lastly there's like a Midas gold kind of place where uh you can you know dump a bunch of money in and you know gamble cuz a couple of days later you'll either get a bunch of money back or basically the gods will say like hey we we didn't like your offering and here you get garbage in return or you can straight up sacrifice your own villagers and just turn them into statues of gold um and and get like little Whichever you perks prefer. and stuff like that so uh yeah there's there's lots of fun ways to to torture your people if that's the way if that's what you want to do in uh, in games like this so um yeah shout out to cult of the lamb uh, Cam, let's throw it back over to you for some Final Fantasy XIV Island Sanctuary stuff. Yeah. Um, so the long-awaited uh, 6.2 uh, update came out for Final Fantasy XIV. Um, it has been nothing short. I have not put as much time into it as I would have liked, mainly because I, I was close to the end of Cyberpunk's 2077, wanted to finish it up, wrap it up, and put a bow on it. Um, yeah, I have gotten my Island Sanctuary. It goes up to level 10. I've gotten mine to level 4. Um, it has, it's a full on quest line and stuff like that. So it's not like, it's not replacing housing, um, which, you know, I kind of wish that it, it was a little in a way, like you got a private Island, so you don't have to worry about owning a house. Um, that would have been nice. Uh, but I will say that it is a extremely cool add on the features in which they're using for like gathering and building and stuff like that is very much streamlined. Um, it is like a menu option in a like brand new menu that you only get if you're on the island it's super segmented off on its own thing and because of that it has its own unique uh like its own unique story in a way um and it ties into kind of like some overall larger world building stuff at the same time that it's just like a fun little side thing to do to like decorate and build out and make your own island sanctuary and it's got uh, animals all over it i've let out almost almost all of my minions out onto the place um, so I have like minions, little minion figures running around everywhere, um, doing like giving out their like iconic lines. It's just been so much fun doing that. And then on top of that, the um, Pandemonium Raid series is going onward. I have not played through that yet. Um, that's the raid stuff. Uh, but then there are two like there's two new areas um, that lead into part of the main story quest as well as. Uh, a dungeon and a new trial um and they're all centered around um final fantasy 4 themed uh the the fiends the four fiends for final fantasy 4 oh fun um and so like i fought and have defeated two of the fiends from final fantasy 4. it's been fantastic which one scar it, scar scar Miglione and casa something something the first two the earth no and no water. no bar bar uh, no, barbatia bar, i i you fight barbatia as a trial Okay. And Skarmiglione is a dungeon boss slash also like a special encounter boss. Um, and ties into kind of like, because there's, so the, the 
the void it has been for a long time kind of like we know that it used to be the 13th shard it used to be like there's a lot of like lore stuff about it that we know from observing and knowing like the overarching history yes but what it's like we we know these things all of us it's that true. played this game know these things <laughs> because we know the lore so well right 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 okay <laughs> Um, anyway, but like it delves into kind of like, what is society like now that everybody's fiends, now that everybody's monsters in the void, what is like, what is the situation like? And like, what is kind of like the internal history and how people kind of view things in this world? Um, as well as like, kind of like, how does their, how does their societies work? And it was a very cool look into a very different kind of world that reminded me a lot of when you first go, when you go to the first in Shadowbringers. And you get to kind of experience like, hey, what is this different ver like variation of this world that I've been exploring for you know tens of hours up to this point? And it's been very cool to kind of see how that has. I'm very excited to see how that kind of wraps itself up at the end of the six point series of the updates. But um, so far, it's been great. I've had a blast doing. It. Very cool. It's I. I knew that the the patch is dropping and then like I started seeing like reports of like oh it's it's going through a lot of the same stuff that like when uh when the the like just everybody's overwhelming the the servers and stuff like that and and right. long queues and stuff like that it's, like all right it I'm died gonna... down very it died down very quick yeah I imagine because so. the because the patches are you know four hours of of content like new new quests and stuff like that or whatever usually but um uh it's definitely something I'm like looking at like maybe Monday when like other people are off at work. I'll take my Monday and I'll I'll hop in and and maybe catch up. We'll see. We'll see how that goes. Um, it's a it's a it's a whole lot of fun. Um, it, there's a lot of cool stuff. Um, the uh, not Elysium. What it was the um, in I'm trying to do it not spoiler spoilery, but in Endwalker when you go to the uh, floating island place that's like the garden. Mm -hmm. Um, that place. Uh, the raid series, the Pandemonium raid series, it's following through with like some stuff relating to that place, right? And that point in time, and so that's that's been pretty cool. very cool. Um, I mean, I, I I've only ever done like the one raid that I did with you after that that you have to do uh, after Realm Reborn stuff. I never went and did any more the the I guess the uh, well, I'm I'm thinking like the big raids, the big like twenty four person raids or whatever. Yeah, those all those stop after. Um, okay. There, there, there are no more twenty four man raids anymore. Okay. After wait, no, there's still, there's still are. Never, yeah. There's still. Okay. Are. In that like, um, in that, this is not one of them. Though. What that like one of those is like how you got like the near automata stuff or whatever in, maybe I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, there, there is like the raids. That raid series is like the near automata stuff. Is that raid series of twenty four? Yeah. Well. Um, very cool. Glad you're enjoying it. Uh, enjoy continuing to build up your farm, uh, up because I know you will get up to level 10 eventually because you're a, a crazy person like that. So have fun doing all that fun stuff. Uh, are you, you are you, uh, you got, you got a good crops there on your, in your island? Sanctuary? Uh, the only thing I've unlocked. So I, oh, I have only recently unlocked crop making, like crop producing, um, because you have to build everything from scratch. There's nothing on that island. Hmm. Uh, building wise and so i built the i built my shack um i built my first farm like plots i've been growing pumpkins because that's the first seed that you get okay. so i have three i have three lanes of pumpkins that i've built out um and yeah mostly i've been spending my time capturing animals and putting them as kind of like on my farm like my so you have like a farm area that's crops and like you're playing uh, Pokemon. You're playing Pokemon in no, Final no, Fantasy no, 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 no. Like, so you capture yeah. your work, like the work animals, instead of buying. Them, yeah, basically. gotcha. So I have, I have a a cool monkey, and a um, it's been great. I've I, been enjoying the iconic out of all the classic you farm said, animal. Talking about a farm, monkey. yeah, I did not. It's on a tropical island. I don't know what to tell you, man. Like, it's it, it climbs know. up the trees and grabs coconuts. Is that is that yeah, how no, how those guys the, yeah. help? I don't know yet. I haven't like done much with. It. All right. I caught one, and it's like it's like you can it's catch more two more. It's more for show, like, Trevor. It's a decorative farm yeah. monkey. Yeah. It really like it's not like a Stardew Valley like in depth farm building thing. Of course. But like it's it's just been fun. Uh, well, very cool. Um, uh, I'm glad you're having a good time with this. Uh, I, I know that if I need you, you'll be there. If I jump back into, um, hundred percent. Uh, Logan. Uh, speaking of oh. jumping back into things, you've been jumping back into Ghost of Tsushima. 
Uh, how's that going? It's fun. I mean, I talked about a little about this with you before we recorded the most recent That D Plus show of a little bit like Cameron at the beginning of this episode for Cyberpunk. I just wanted a kind of world to just be in and get lost in. Um, I mean, I guess actually a little bit like you in Skyrim too, in fact. We're all on the same wavelength. Uh, and, you know, a little bit more like you actually, Trevor, I guess. I wanted just some place that, like I was already familiar with and knew really well. Um, and, you know, that is this island, right? And that is these characters. And I loved the game. Again, it was my game of the year for 2020. Um, and I'd always wanted to just kind of finish off everything and just kind of clear out the island of all the kind of goodies and whatnot. And so the last couple of weeks, I started to do that. Um, and yeah, I, I think the game is great, right? Like, I think the way I described it to you kind of off air, Trev, was I'm not someone who goes back through and platinums games that often or 100% games that often because, you know, as the person who plays games for the stories, once I get to the end of it, I typically find those worlds to be kind of missing something and just kind of feeling empty and I don't feel as compelled to just kind of check off the boxes on something. But I think this is a game that has a world that is so alive and so rich and so kind of constantly moving that I do feel really compelled to do it. Um, And a little bit like when we had our spoiler cache for the game, for me so often when I play a video game, I almost view it as like, I am playing through a movie kind of thing, right? Especially if it's a cinematic game like this is, and I'm, you know, journeying through a movie. But very quickly with Ghost, I viewed it almost more as like, this is a like three season, like mini series, right? Like a limited run show, like each kind of section of the island is its own like season long arc. And so now that I've like finished that, I almost view this as like, and great, we got like one last like, you know, like, post the invasion post beating the con season of just like wrapping up all the loose ends and finishing up the characters kind of like story arcs and all that kind of thing and bringing it to a close and actually ridding the island of like all the minor villains that are left uh, and so i'm viewing it almost just as like a like david chase come back to sopranos after 15 years to do like one last like little movie thing of just like here's the finale actually of ghost and I'm having a lot of fun with it like that. Um, I think it is just such a great game and such a great world. And it's so, 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 so beautiful. And every time I play the game, I'm always reminded of the fact that Cameron played this on black and white his entire first playthrough. <laughs> and it boggles my mind. It, like, I, I really do think it is just one of the like three or four most beautiful games and like visually colorfully rich games that I've ever played. And so just like, oh man, what a thing that he didn't get all of this, his first time through in colors. It's so, it's so just rich. And I Dude, love the it's, colors. It's game. beautiful in such I'm an sure. incredible way, even because it's not black just like white, a yeah. straight black and white, but like getting to notice the, um, the levels in which color, like color gradient works in Shade that kind of, in that yeah, deep use, spectrum yeah. is very interesting. And it, draws your attention to different things like mm-hmm. draw the, the attention that is drawn to movement and especially the sword play yeah. is feels so much stronger in the monotone nature of um not monotone sorry um monochrome i've whatever black and black the and black and whiteness yeah. of it monochromatic is, yeah monochromatic yeah thank you the monochromatic nature of it makes it so that when the light hits like when the white spots hit the sword mm-hmm. it's much more like like there's such a strong definition between the two and then on top of that when you hit, see those like the strikes like the the red and white strikes that tell you that give you prediction first off they're not red in the monochromatic version all of them look the same <laughs> it's a massive oversight from sucker punch on that so it's like is this move but that also made me adapt to because is the character model doing this very specific move that i now know is unblockable Mm-hmm. or are they do like what is the variation of that and so it makes you pay attention to different things that's really cool yeah um the learning curve on that though is stark and drastic and very painful I'm- uh that that being said um it still is such a striking game in the black and white visuals uh the way that the the swords and all the other stuff kind of like 
especially with fire. Fire so prominent in that game with buildings yeah. on fire, stuff like that. The way fire works in that monochromatic spectrum of colors is there's not a lot. If there's not an easy way to hide fire effect from being looking either janky or gorgeous. <laughs> if you if you don't have right. a strong color gradient right. to work with and it looks gorgeous in black and white like it looks yeah. the fire in that game looks incredible but it that takes an extra level of you know, you know panache an extra level like a skosh just bit more of polish mm. that they put into that game and that's what makes it, it, it like that elevates that game even higher for me yeah um, i mean so we, i love that game we talked about it in our sport like let's go check it out plug uh, that like one of the things I really love about the game is the fact that all three of us played that game in three different ways. Um, and I think that alone is such a cool idea, right? Kind of seeing like the slow, like grade of like Cameron played it in Japanese and black and white. I played it in Japanese and color. Trevor played it in English and color and like just the differences that are there. Right. And I think we needed Frank to play it in black and white, but with English. in English. Right. Yeah. Like I just love the fact that like, you know, we this game affords kind of not just any play style you want but also like any visual style or any like audio style of this game you want and the difference is there right the difference is in those characters between like the english and japanese voice acting and between like what a black and white storytelling medium is going to do versus what one you know resplendent in colors is going to do and I just think it is, yeah, it's just, I think it's an incredible, incredible game. Um, and two years later, um, it still might be my favorite thing I've played. And yeah, so it's just been a blast going through again and just kind of cleaning up. And um, yeah, I, the last thing I would say is that I think one under-discussed thing is, I mean, maybe it's not, I don't know, but I feel like it's under discussing conversations I have about the game is just how good that sword play is, I think. And like the parry system and everything about it just feels so well and feels so intuitive that you like it's a skill you actually hone and get better at and learn over time. So that if you do take like a two year break, like I have, almost like muscle memory, it kicks back on and within like seemingly no time, you can kind of pick it back up again and get back into like knowing like the time and on when they're going to swing their sword and blade and when they're going to do this and that and yeah it's just excellent and i think from every level i've i've just enjoyed going back to it yeah to i mean to to that point i that was that was the really fun difference that i that i enjoyed about how the three of us approach the game well yes it's it's also fun the the like language and and color kind of differences but like i remember when we originally talked about it like uh, if I recall correctly, like Cameron got really into the standoff kind of uh, oh, I, I got fights, the it. showdowns and stuff like that. <laughs> and you were playing it with like a lot of like sneaky Assassin's Creed yeah, kind of vibes and stuff. Yeah, stuff. And yeah. I really loved, yeah, that the combat and the like the fluid nature and dancing between um, uh, the different stances, depending on the enemies that were around and like building up uh, what would would essentially be these like you know, epic combos um, as I, you know, would take out one person with one form, switch to another form to take out the the guy with the spear behind me and then switch over to this yeah. for the heavy and, and do that. And, and how and yeah. fluid that all is. Exactly. Too. Yeah. Um, like once, once everything is like opened up and unlocked that game, just it, it sings very, very yeah. well. Um, I also want to say that like, as Cameron was talking about like all of his justification, like in the back of my mind, I'm like, I know this isn't really the case, but it kind of seems like he spent the last year and a half, uh, coming up with like, like explaining to himself why playing it in black and white was the way to go <laughs> after first playing or after going back and playing it in color and seeing how beautiful pink like, cherry oh, blossoms shit. are and is, stuff yeah. like that and being like oh my god oh my god i should have done it this way but let me let me justify why it was Listen, great man, I, why I, all I these gradient things of black and white were. Of i enjoyed it i could have told you that before but no i do agree i think the way that game plays with color especially in nighttime is incredible mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And gets lost in the in the monochromatic nature of the Kurosawa mode. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, also I love the English voice cast. The English voice cast is incredible. They yeah. do an amazing job. In this game. Yeah. Um, and for like and for the the Japanese cast and the English cast both to be spectacular. The Japanese cast is so good. Yeah. And the motion capture in the game for the cutscenes is incredible. Like I, there's not a bad thing to really say about this game. 
other than uh it like oh it like it had a competition that year with like some other stuff mm-hmm. but it was our game of the year that year so yep. it was one thing i'll say too for the game you know in its discussion of how beautiful and gorgeous it is is that cameron talked a little bit about how i think tricky fire can be to animate and either looking like really excellent or like that looks like you know it's a jpeg from the ps2 era fire but like one thing that i think is really underappreciated that is like hard to nail is like snowy mountain areas which is like the entire last third of that game and those so often can just be like this is just like white flat stuff and like there's no sort of like depth to it um and i think they nailed having you feel the change in like climate and the change in weather and the change in temperature in the entire last third act of that game. And you almost can like feel your own bones and to like feel that chill. And it's just nailed and it's gorgeously done. And the way you can like see the little like wind drifts blowing over the top of a mountain is just like absolutely gorgeous. And something that is really actually so 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 hard to nail mm-hmm. it, to the point i would also make about that is that even in in the monochromatic black and white mode that they have snow doesn't get lost snow has depth and texture that separates it from just like empty white air like the empty air around the characters it's not colored there is a level of texture that they took on that game in that game that made the snow stand out from anything else in it. it's Truly incredible. Like the, the what yeah. they did for that game on every level that they did it is incredible. Sucker Punch is out like without needing to really say it, is such an incredible <laughs> studio. Right, I'll, I'll yeah. never I'll never forget when the Yak the director of the Yakuza series said like yeah. they made they made a better game about Japan than we've ever than, than anybody else has ever made. And like they're all a bunch of like Americans. They're all a bunch of white guys in Seattle. And it's they're like from Seattle, man, yeah, just vibing. It's it is. Um the only thing to really say about the game that's to its detriment is that um when the Mongol invasion was happening. Samurai weren't using katanas. Katanas, the katana forging process that we see to produce katanas like they have in the game wasn't around yet. It was too early. Well, that's okay, it. Man. Let's. I guess we got to take away the game of the year. <laughs> Wrap it up. All right. Um, uh, it's now a nine point nine. Thank you, you very uh, much. You jump no back in. Perfect. Logan, are you gonna <laughs> yeah. check out the uh, the Eco Island DLC? I've been thinking about that. Um, it depends, and again, it'll make the three season show into a four season show. Um, yeah, I've definitely been thinking about it. Right, um, I know it's like there are some like subtle differences there too. It also should be said that like you know I haven't jumped into it again, but like I also really loved my time in like the Legends multiplayer that I did with Trevor. Mm-hmm. We did that entire and one- we did that whole <laughs> thing in one day um and yeah i really enjoyed that as well and so i'd also potentially look at doing that again but it is just a game that i think is yeah it's oh it's so good game i was gonna say Um, after we moved on i was gonna like we need to take a moment to just shout out that multiplayer because it's incredible it's so good i had so much fun with it yeah and so yeah definitely maybe um i don't even know how much that dlc is now probably like 20 i mean i want to say yeah i want to say it's like 20 dollars, but you can probably get it on sale you know half the time or something like that um right i'll look into it for sure um, that'd be a fun thing to do i uh i mean obviously you're going for the platinum uh on it i picked up the platinum on it again this year because uh they did the thing where like if you you know if you get the ps5 version of the game it, and just like transfer your save it'll auto pop everything Give so i was like thing, Haha, yeah. it was one of my first platinums of 2022 was was uh, i think i got it after the the nightmare that was the uh uncharted a thief's legacy or whatever mm. where you had to play Uncharted 4 and uh, Lost Legacy uh, to get the platinum in that, uh, or like do everything in both of those to I get the platinum. The, I hate the Uncharted that, platinums. That was terrible. Um, but uh, Naughty Dog's yeah. never been good at trophies. It's just like always been like their Achilles so It's such a bad trophy list. The the thing that doesn't make them suck as much nowadays is like um, you can bring all the cheats over and do the uh, for the crushing. Uh, you know, run that you have to do or something like that. So like, uh, I which I did not know the first time I did it on on PS4. Uh, so like, I definitely got stuck in one area where I only had like 17 bullets uh, mm. and, and was like, I'm fucked. I don't know how I'm going to make it through this area and tried it like 30 times before I finally succeeded. Uh, and then at, like almost immediately after that, I, I found out that I could have like just cheated and I was like, son of a bitch. <laughs> um, all right. Well, that's going to happen for the speed run. Um but yeah, uh, just like 
uh, like Ghost of Tsushima is another one of those that like I haven't gone back for the eco island stuff, but it's it's one Ooh, of those I that's like that. on my on my radar of like yeah, like I I I believe I've bought the eco island. I just haven't gone back and played um played it. Um and yeah, it's Same definitely actually. one I, like yeah. I want to be Ooh, like every every now and then. a little group play through this. Yeah. Um, yeah. um well let us uh wrap up then here uh with uh, a league of their own uh yeah i'm um, I'm curious about this one this is uh uh are either you guys fans of the uh the original 90s movie a league of their own one thousand percent one thousand percent are you kidding me very that much is a, right that answer. is a abbott that is an abbott There's family no crying classic in baseball film. all right that that is an abbott family classic my yeah, all three same. of Wilkinson my sisters played classic. softball yeah. like it is um like That's that so is good. an abbott family staple of a movie mm-hmm. yeah um, in our little TV that we used to take on road trips as a family, mm-hmm. a league of their own was a necessary take on every single. Mm-hmm. I I believe this is one of the ones I did. Uh, uh, I'm pretty sure like Alamo did it as a um, uh, like a, a movie party kind of thing uh, at one point. And I'm pretty sure I went and saw it. Maybe like I definitely know I went and saw Sandlot with you, Cam. I'm pretty sure I also did a League of Their Own one, but maybe not. Um, but a League of Their Own, the, I mean, the original movie obviously is is iconic, is a classic. classic. Um, and so, like, I had seen that they were doing this series on Amazon, um, and was like, oh, I don't, like, I don't. I, that's that's one of those things I didn't think needs to be revisited. Like Back right. to the Future, if they came back and were like, we're doing Back to the Future, I'm like, don't don't like the the first one's already like magic. You don't Perfect. like how are you going to recapture that? Um, and doing it as a series, um, they, they change enough elements of the story that like, it's, it's still really, really good. I was like, especially like wrapping it up earlier today, watching the last couple episodes, um, today, like it's a great cast, great story. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was getting invested and like was tearing up when characters were having like you know, big cathartic moments kind of in the, uh, in the, in the closing chapters today. Um, uh, the biggest difference is just to kind of give like the, the, the ballpark pitch of the, uh, of the film, but or of the series, um, rather than following, uh, like the story of Dottie and Kit from the first one. Um, this one is following kind of a dual narrative. Um, we have Carson Shaw is kind of the, uh, she's, she's the, 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 everybody refers to her as a farm girl, but she didn't actually like, she's not actually from a farm, but she's from Idaho. Uh, she's kind of like the first one we meet. She's, you know, tr- running to catch a train. She's all flustered and stuff, but she's heading to, to Illinois to try out for the all American league. Uh, and then on the flip side, we have, um, uh, African American girl Max, who is dreams of of being a uh, a pitcher, uh, and and Carson is a catcher, um, and uh, and and we kind of see over the course of the the season like their narratives and how they kind of like cross paths every now and then and and intertwine. Uh, Max, very you know it you know very it, uh, dismissed because of racial lines and all that stuff. So she is basically like not even considered for the all American league. She shows up to, to tryouts. She throws a, uh, you know, a pitch to try and show she, what she's got. And they just immediately kick her out. And, um, but she happens to live in Rockford. So like her path crosses with the Rockford peaches every now and then. Um, and rather than have like the, the Tom Hanks, Jimmy Duggan character kind of thing, um, there is a similar coach played by Nick Offerman kind of early on, but he, gets kind of pulled out of the story pretty quickly and and Shaw ends up kind of having to like step up and lead the team become a de facto cap uh, coach of the team while also playing catcher and while also navigating all of the life things she's dealing with Mm. trying to navigate the team there's you know classic come from behind kind of stuff um and then there's you know just a handful of other characters in the mix that that we kind of spend time with um the show does a fun job of kind of like piecing out little nods to the original like there is you know obviously like references to there's no crying in baseball kind of stuff um uh and and the way they play with like homages and callbacks to the original a lot of fun uh rosie o'donnell pops up in a in a fun little cameo uh later in the series um and one of the the 
I think most interesting elements that gets introduced pretty early on is um, that it is a very queer centric story. Um, and uh, a lot of the characters are, uh, are, are, you know, some form of LGBTQ. Um, and obviously this is from an era where that's never a term that's going to get thrown around. They are instead called inverts. Um, and of course society is like looking down, like they're, they are a plague, um, and, and all that stuff. So people are kind of having to navigate like the social norms of, of all of those struggles as well, um, in ways that are, I think at times I found myself thinking like, Oh, I feel like these people would be like way more punished for what they're getting caught doing or something like that. Or, or, Mm -hmm. you know, or, or the dangers much higher than is conveyed. Um, but uh, like, it's still like when, when the danger hits, it's like, Oh, yep. That's they, they got fucked. Um, and, and there's just like this beautiful camaraderie around it all, all like, despite, you know, the, the dangers and the struggles that some of them are going through. Um, and there is like these weird coming of age, isn't necessarily the right thing, but like coming into coming to terms with who you are and, and these stories of self-discovery, both on the Shaw side of things and on the Maxine side of things. Um, and especially when those, when those two characters, kind of are really the only links to one another's story. There's not a ton of like crossing the streams between them. So like when we get scenes with the two of them together um, playing catch, obviously because you have one as a pitcher and one as a catcher um, are some of like the, the just nicest moments in the series, um, especially because they are like finding common ground across obviously the still very tense racial lines and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, lots of, lots of really good stuff in here. And it definitely went places I was not expecting. Um, when I, like I, I hopped in because I'd seen a few people be like, yo, the series is really good. You should check it out. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, all right, I'll like, I, I love the original. Um, I'll throw this on. And yeah, like the first night I threw on like an episode thinking like, Oh, I'll watch like one of these before I go to bed. And then I'll watch like three more episodes after that. (laughs) Like not a super late night for me, but it's still like probably later than I would have originally planned on staying up. But uh, I just was like, I want to see what happens next. Um, uh, so yeah, they do a really good job with it. Uh, lots of, lots of great performances. Um, a lot of like people that I'm not, overly familiar with i haven't seen a lot of them in other things um uh like nick offerman being like the the big standout that i knew from from something else but uh everybody really shines uh in here and uh and just is is crushing it um and it definitely like tees up uh a a like where a second season can go from here and stuff like that so um i i look forward to seeing where they continue telling the story when it eventually comes back but yeah uh league of our own uh kind of reimagined with some similar thematic ideas but then a whole lot of new ones for uh for a a 21st century kind of storytelling um so yeah i don't know if, you, if, if there are any any questions or anything i can uh can add no. to that but no. i i'm really excited i want to check it out now so I know. <laughs> de- definitely. Recommend. I already wanted to check it out. Yeah, it's it's yeah. It, I was on the fence. I like I I was very much like not like excited for the series. Um, mm-hmm. just because I was like I just don't know how you're gonna capture that film. Um, that I, in a te- in a televised format, like in an episodic format. So here, like I've heard people say it was good, but when you brought up like they bring up LGBTQ stuff, inverts, that sort of thing, that one thousand percent piqued my interest. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Um, and because expo- I'm like, I could watch this exploring the racial divides. But that's like that's a heavy topic on itself. Like and that's interesting. But like, how like how are they going to. Oh, she got she wasn't allowed on the team. So what's she, what's she going to do yeah. now? Yeah, it's like, like I'm, I'm curious about that. I mean, I'll say like since uh, most of since the, the story that like we would all expect and are all familiar with is is following kind of the Rockford Peaches and the and, and that team, Max's story uh, in terms of like continuing to kind of keep her in, involved with baseball, like she obviously does not get to join the Rockford Peaches at all or anything like that. But she's trying to join the factory team. She's trying to be like the girl that makes it onto the factory team. But initially, the factory isn't even hiring uh, women of color. Um, but it's very like 
it's very much like, well, a week ago they weren't hiring men of color either, but everybody's going off to the front and they need all the bodies they can get. So eventually she kind of like makes her way in, gets gets a job in the factory, tries to go out for the factory team and and kind of and and you know that doesn't have the results that she died. So she starts having this like big doubt because she's very much like she is presented and she certainly has the the um uh the opinion of herself that she would wipe the floor with anybody of of the actual all american league people um and she thinks she's better than any of the men playing on the factory team and stuff and so when like things don't necessarily go to plan as she expected uh, on that front she kind of has to start like reevaluating herself and thinking about who she is while she's also struggling with her own identity and and you know lgbt where do, where does she fall and kind of in that spectrum of things um kind of storyline so um it's 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 fascinating like the if if you told me going into this like hey half this show isn't going to be about like the league of their own rockford peaches kind of thing it's going to be telling this other story i'd be like okay well I don't, i'm not really interested in that just like just just do the a league of their own stuff but that like the fact that it's as compelling of a story and as interesting uh sometimes even more so um because i will say like while obviously the racial divide is obviously a thing going on like that's not really what this is about it's it's i mean their stories are largely segregated but it's not about their stories being segregated it's about like narratively we're telling this story with the rockford peaches and we're telling this story with max and her journey um team. and occasionally you get max and and carson kind of like crossing paths and you know seeing things that you know one or the other aren't aren't happy about them seeing or whatever and and how they can kind of like um yeah, just how they how they learn from one another as the story goes on is is also an, a fascinating element. But yeah, it's it's not overly about like well, yeah, no, I guess I guess there are elements later on where where one of the other characters, one of Maxine's like friend characters, really starts like seeing like. She, there, she has a fun screed against um, the Wizard of Oz where she's like, Dorothy is the villain and she's terrible and she's evil and she's like she's a colonizer and stuff like that. And it ends up becoming a little bit of like uh, a racially driven kind of screed. But it's like it's certainly played more for comedy, but there is also you know, obviously a hint of uh, or a significant hint of truth to that. So, um, yeah, lots of good stuff there with uh, A League of Their Own. Highly recommend to anybody to uh, to check out the uh, Amazon Prime series, eight episodes. Uh, I want to say like you know, fifty minutes, hour ish per episode, kind of thing. So um, you knock it out in, a, in a, over the course of a, a few days, um, probably pretty easily. But yeah, shout out to uh, a league of their own and the the team that just decided to tell some really cool stories about uh, lots of awesome women. Um, so yeah. Um, well, I think that is going to wrap it up for this week's episode. Thank you guys for joining me to talk about all these fun little topics. Uh, mm -hmm. Been uh, certainly a, a, a meaty one today, um, uh, as, uh, as it often is when we have a trio of folks on to share their nerdy things. Um, let's go around our metaphorical table with any plugs we might have. You can follow Logan at Lefty Logie, L-O-G-G-Y. Anything you want to give a shout out to there, Logan? Hey, me and Trevor talked about um, a few different things last few weeks. We did an episode on the first few Pixar shorts on that D Plus show. We did an episode on She Hulk. We did an episode on the Lego Summer Vacation for Star Wars last week. Um, so go check out all those. Those were a lot of fun D Plus conversations. Um, so yeah, go check it out. Cool, cool. Uh, you can follow Cameron at Rev Cabot. Anything you want to give a shout out to there, Cam? Yeah, yeah. I definitely want to give a shout out. I know that we mentioned it earlier, um, but definitely Trevor's Let's Plays. Uh, we have an entire Skyrim series about to come out about him. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, so look forward to those. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can follow me at Trevor J. Starkey. Um, uh, I've, I say definitely in a few of the, the Skyrim episodes of like, eh, who knows how long this is going to go. I don't know if it will be like a complete playthrough of it. Like, Oh I don't no, know if I, I, will, I, I, if I, I don't want to say that. Yeah. If I will ultimately like play through the entire series or whatever, but I'm going to keep playing, uh, as long as, uh, and, uh, as long as I'm, you know, um, enjoying myself, having fun with it. It's definitely an interesting one to do because like it is a game, I, I 
like I find myself and I know you did this too, Cam, you ran into this with Friday Night Dying Light, where it's like you you're playing it and you're playing it for camera, but you don't want to play everything on camera or whatever. And and so there are definitely like there are like quest lines where I'm like, OK, I'm going to save that one for when I'm recording an episode. Um, so let me find like random dumb things that I can go do to like level up or just because I want to be playing this game, you know, on my Sunday day off, but I don't want to be recording myself playing every minute of this game. (laughs) Um, so it's, it's that like finding, you know, the, the mix of finding like what I can do off stream versus what I'm doing, um, for the let's plays and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, check that out. That's going to be coming out for at least the next few weeks. I've already got episode. I've already got up up through episode seven, like scheduled and and uploaded. Um, so you can find those uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays for the the coming weeks. Might you know, depending on what comes out in the next couple weeks, um, or what I might hop into elsewhere, I might like boot one of those down the line or something, and and kind of shuffle the schedule, throw something else in there. But. Um, but yeah, check uh, check out our Let's Plays every Tuesday and Thursday. Um, and I will uh, also just echo the shout out at the top. Uh, check out um, our uh, our nearing the end series, Friday Night Dying Light, on Friday mm-hmm. evenings. Uh, Absolutely. As, as uh, Cameron wraps up Dying Light 2. Um, uh, they, what like Gamescom, they announced like, here's like the big story DLC for Dying Light 2. And I, I like, I refrained from texting you, Cameron, being like, so you're going to buy this and, and, uh, hop back in and do an epilogue. <laughs> um, uh, cause I imagine the answer is no, but, uh, it's definitely the something I thought. No, yeah. the answer is fuck off. Yeah. This game is, I'm, I'm done with this game for a while. That's yeah, fair. Like, I, um, this DLC would have to like be like the, the creme de la creme, like best thing ever for me to pop back into this game not that it's a bad game but just like it's there, there's it's <laughs> we, i'll have more to talk about as far as like my feelings on this game but i have a very my experience of playing this game has been extremely different than any other game i've played because it's i've done such a long let's play series with it yeah um but like you want to do an epilogue with it no i did 34 episodes i did 34 episodes and that's not including a lost episode i would have had 35 maybe even 36 episodes yeah like yeah. it's this has not been no, like a you. simple process. My feelings on this game are very complicated. Thirty five episodes of Dying Light Two is very very yeah. fair. You did you did the Lord's work on that one, Cameron. Uh, you can follow all it's of us. Somebody's work. You can follow all of us over at that nerdy site or go to that nerdy site.com for all the latest from us. Once again, if you liked what you heard, please rate, review, like, subscribe, share the podcast with your friends, all that fun stuff. As always, thank you for listening. Stay nerdy and be good to each other. <laughs>